Hello, and welcome to Working Amateur Satellites. I'd like to be able to uh, give you some information about how the satellites operate, uh, what you can expect when you're on the air, and hopefully uh, kind of kick off a little interest here and get uh, as many people as possible to play this game. Um, I think they're great fun, and I would like to see lots more people doing it. First, let's go a little bit into history. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse here. We'll go a little bit into the history of some of the amateur satellites, um, a little bit about satellite law, uh, what's going on nowadays, a little bit of the international efforts of, uh, for amateur satellites. Then we will explore the uh, AMSAT webpage itself a little bit. Quite honestly, because it is one of the best places to gather information about what's going on, what the satellites are like, to, uh, and, and how they're doing in operation at the moment. Uh, then we will go directly into satellite operation, what you can expect to hear on the air, why, why things uh, will, will change a little bit in what you're hearing on the air, and a little bit about setting up a satellite station. Okay, so let's uh, jump right into some history. So amateur satellites uh, began, I guess, in the 70s. Uh, for me, <laughs> my involvement began in the 80s, I guess, uh, and they were already up and operational. Operation was on 2 meters and 10 meters uh, and moved very quickly to 2 meters and 440. Now, 440 at the time was sort of an experimental band. You kind of had to make some of your own equipment. It wasn't common. To be able to come across 440 equipment, but um, that's all in the past. Now, of course, two meters and 440 is very common, and uh, an HT with two meters and 440 is all you need to be able to work satellites. Uh, and very likely, that's not going to change much in the future. So, uh, so your equipment that you have right now is still useful. Uh, the, the older satellites were large. Uh, they ranged in size from, say, maybe a five-gallon bucket to a garage can size, uh, garbage can size. Some were a little bit larger than that, uh, but not many. And uh, I, I really honestly don't know how amateurs were able to pull off launches of satellites <laughs> at that time. But um, it's it's getting that's another thing that's getting harder to do which is get a chance to get your satellite launched some of the earlier ones actually had rocket motors on board um, so that they could move from a circular orbit into a, a larger sort of uh, elliptical orbit nowadays i think uh, talking someone into a amateur building a satellite with a rocket motor on it that has uh, fuel that can explode is going to be a little more difficult, but apparently <laughs> in the past things were a little more open. Okay, now the satellites, pretty much all satellites work this way. Um, they're powered by solar cells and, um, and they tend to be spin stabilized um, so that they can possibly, they will be spinning on one axis of some sort, so they stay pointed on some axis. But the real reason for the spin is um, to kind of evenly heat the satellite. Up in the sun there, the sun is very, the sun side is very hot, and the um, non-sun side is very cold. So um, spinning them is really the way that you help the electronics on board. So, little bit of history here, uh, and the reason I brought these two up, these are old satellites, but they're still operating. A07 is still one you can use, uh, was put up in the 80, in the 70s, and uh, this is what it looks like in space. Um, it has 2 meters and 10 meters on board. You can see the 10 meter antenna on that satellite. The 2 meter antenna is these beams here. Fuji Oscar 29 is also has been a fabulous satellite for years. I think now its batteries are beginning to fail a little bit, but it's been an incredible operator. And you can see its physical size here by comparison as they're doing some testing. You can see it's covered with solar cells, as I mentioned. AO13 was a somewhat large satellite. It's roughly about six feet across, 
reason I bring this one up is because this did indeed have a rocket motor. Uh, you can see the, the motor in this portion of the picture here, or in the, uh, uh, the drawing, you can see the motor in this area. And it was used to um, accelerate the satellite up into a, an elliptical orbit where you could actually uh, see the thing. You, you, the, the thing would be in view for a long period of time. You could work the satellite for, for an hour and a half or so. So satellite law has had to come in place a little bit now that we're putting up more things. Um, and one of the most important things is in the world of space debris, you have to develop a plan before you can get your satellite to be launched. This has been agreed upon around the world, but you have to be able to have some form of a plan to be able to remove the satellite from the sky after 25 years of operation. Now, there is already controversy about that thought, and there are some people wanting to make that less time. Uh, it may be a good idea. Maybe 25 years is too long. Maybe it should be 15 years. Um, and there's a huge amount of effort going on in low Earth orbit, LEO satellites. Low, LEO satellites. There's companies and everything else involved in amateur satellites, mostly are, are low Earth orbit satellites. But there is an interesting thought about this. Um, as we have filled up space, it will reach a point where the low Earth orbit satellites themselves are becoming a problem. Uh, as John Jenko wants to mention here, putting a non-maneuverable CubeSat, for example, in low Earth orbit, in densely populated orbits, it's a little bit like allowing go-karts to be on the freeway. It's probably something you shouldn't do. Um, if you're going to try to be able to launch through a crowded area with a bunch of small things in the way, you're looking for trouble. And he's possibly got a point. So uh, as time goes on, we're going to end up having to be careful about how much we've put up in space. Uh, so there's things that are called graveyard orbits and satellites. Um, uh, how, how do you... How do you make a plan to be able to get your satellite out of orbit? That's part of the plan you have to make as you launch one. There's also um, international space law seems to be um, open. Uh, it's hard to determine if, if uh, there's agreement taking place around the world. Uh, so we don't really have full... Uh, understanding of how it is that we're going to handle space. I guess that's the way to leave it. So here's an interesting uh, video of satellites in orbit. This is a map of our current set of satellites. You can see the, uh, the large band here would be the satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit. The uh, low Earth orbit satellites are so close in around here, you can't hardly even tell the difference between them and the atmosphere. There's so many, so many going around the Earth that it's hard to tell what's, what's going on. But this is, um, there's space, there's a lot of space in space, and, and these things are not hitting each other, but uh, as you can see, it may become a problem. Okay, moving on. In the world of amateur satellites, uh, there is Organizations around the world, uh, AMSAT is one, uh, amateur SAT, so AMSAT North America is the one here in the United States. There's AMSAT Deutschland, AMSAT UK, there's AMSAT Japan, and in China there's CAMSAT. Uh, but to give you an idea, AMSAT Deutschland has actually put up a geosynchronous amateur uh, payload. Um, that's quite an accomplishment. And they also have a rather ambitious project going called uh, Go Mars, which is to actually orbit a satellite around Mars. AMSAT UK has been very deeply involved in making the things they call the fun cube sats. They're cube sats, uh, fun cubes. And they also tend to have a, uh, a support structure of sorts to, su to support ground stations. Um, and, and be able to do satellite control. 
but they're not the only ones in the game. Philippines have put up satellite, PO101, works great. Saudi Sat, SO50, has been up for quite a while, and um, that's a very popular satellite. Argentina now has a transponder satellite up. Uh, Jordan has put up a satellite. China, as mentioned, has the, um, the XW sats, which have been very successful, and the CAS sats. Um, most of the development and uh, efforts comes from universities in these countries. Uh, in China, student satellites, there's actually a, a satellite launched by student, uh, university students that's orbiting the moon. Okay, so Deutschland, Emsat Deutschland, uh, this is the footprint of their geosynchronous satellite. <clears throat> it covers, it's, it's over Africa, so it covers Europe. It um, can be touch portions of uh, Indonesia over here, a little bit of South America, but it's not where we will see it in uh, North America. So um, we really have no view of that geosynchronous satellite. Um, I see a lot of effort, a lot of excitement going on with amateurs in Europe, building equipment to be able to communicate on it. Uh, it it's 2.4 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz up and down links. <clears throat> so a little bit uh, into the realm of experimental equipment. You can buy equipment for these uh, ranges, but you can also build your own. So it's, um, it's sort of uh, sparking a, uh, a, a bunch of development. Uh, the Go Mars project is uh, hoping for launch. Um, its uh, initial plans was in 2002, and then they restarted it as a plan in 2012 and tried again in 2018. <laughs> I think it's very aggressive, uh, and let's, uh, let's wish them luck. Uh, AMSAT UK, as mentioned, has a lot of capability for ground support. Uh, they have a science control center. They also have a main uh, control center uh, with up and down link capability and um, monitoring capability. <clears throat> they tend to be very successful in the range of um, doing ground support for a lot of the satellites. I believe a great deal of the Earth of the world is using their, their uh, facilities. Okay, let's go to AMSAT North America and look around a little bit. So I'm going to leave my uh, PowerPoint presentation and uh, let's open a web browser here. Okay, so this is AMSAT's homepage, AMSAT North America's homepage. And I'd like to invite you to navigate to this bar here to satellite info. Let's look at communication satellites. And the good news, the good, the good news about AMSAT North America is that they, they have everything, they, they have a good list of everything available. Uh, the communication satellites, for example. This is the list of FM repeater satellites that can be operated and the transponder satellites and the digital satellites. For any of you who don't, don't know what FM or transponder or digital means, we'll get that in a minute. But look at how many amateur, these are amateur satellites, look at how many are available for use. Another thing on their page here would be uh, the current status. Under satellite info, we'll go to current status. Now this is an interesting page. Um, amateurs using the satellites can, can add to this page. Uh, what you would do here is if you heard the satellite, you would say which one it was, what you heard, what time it was, and submit your data and provide a list of operational capabilities. You can see by date, this is today's date, and then that's yesterday, and then the day before yesterday. And so it's six days back in a row with this being the most fresh and the various colors. Yellow would mean there's telemetry beacons. Uh, blue means that the voice transponder was active and you possibly heard voices. So uh, I am, so if you wanted to work, for example, voice here on AO27 looked quite successful. Um, uh, and, and a few people have put in their, their information. Uh, 
WD9EWK says that he heard it. Um, AA5PK says that he heard it at this time. Others, for example, here's a single. Um, and, and you can go to this page and you can find out immediately what satellites are on the air having been used or are being used at the moment and, uh, and if they're operational. So that's a very handy thing to see on the page. There are many more things on this page. I invite you all to explore uh, this location and you can even look up uh, software, uh, satellite prediction software and things like that. Okay, let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint. So satellite operation, what can you really expect when you actually get on the air for satellites? Well, almost all the satellites up are CubeSats, meaning that they're small. Uh, they would all be up in low Earth orbits, meaning that they're close. Uh, therefore, going by fast. So what you get is you get a time where they're overhead from horizon to horizon. It's probably less than 20 minutes in most cases. And the satellite, of course, has got radiating antennas on board. Um, we'll talk a little bit about their, what, what that means. And also, many people are trying to use the satellites, and multiple users at the same time, there can be some effects from that. But of course, the most important thing going on all the time is Doppler. Uh, the satellites are moving so fast that they will indeed affect your uh, RF signal and shift you out of frequency. The Doppler, it's an ever-present issue. They, of course, um, as they're getting closer to you, they're shifting up. Uh, you're up in frequency. Are they going away from you? It's going to be down in frequency. And what's the right or the easiest way in today's world to handle such things? Software. Software that will predict what these uh, frequency offsets are going to be. So let's get into it. Okay, for example, this is a CubeSat. This is from AMS, uh, AMSAT UK. It's the fun cube. Um, Look at the physical size here of this satellite. It's roughly six inches square. At any one time, only half of its solar panels are going to be able to be in sunlight. So you can imagine how much power uh, such a device can have. Uh, this, this would be its radiating antennas, and possibly it's producing about five watt output. Um, Let's go take a look at some. The Fun Cube 3 was a double satellite. It's two, two cubes, uh, one, two, one, two, and uh, had a payload on board, including a camera and some other sensors. Now, here is an interesting issue of, of a launch of these CubeSats coming from the International Space Station. You can see the, uh, the launch device up here. Uh, what you could do is you can load the satellite in uh, to these various containers and pop the doors and a little spring action can shoot them out so we can get the thing launched away from the uh, space station. And notice here uh, in this picture the, the satellites are still close enough that you can get a very fairly good picture of them from the space station and they're already they're already tumbling and, and appearing to be in different orientations. <laughs> so, um, so it doesn't take uh, much to be able to, to get them out of whack. And the ground control team works to be able to spin stabilize it in, in whatever pointing position they would like to have. Usually it takes a few months to get that uh, to, to start working correctly. Um, working with Earth's magnetic field, they can get the thing to rotate and spin into the orientation they want. Okay, so satellites in orbit. An awful lot of the time what you'll see is a picture like this. Says, here's, here's Earth and here's a satellite and a slightly elliptical sort of thing and they say, look, satellite going around the Earth. Well, actually, let's look at the reality. Okay, in, 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 real, in, in real size pictures, a low Earth orbit satellite really is, is more like this. The Earth is uh, 8,000 miles in diameter, and the satellite is maybe uh, uh, 250 miles up. So it 
kind of looks like its orbit is more like this. Uh, it's quite close to us. The International Space Station, for example, is even closer than these satellites, whipping around the Earth uh, fairly quickly. So you see, the satellite itself, even though it may have uh, the ability to see from horizon to horizon, its, its horizon view is still limited to about this. So it's, it can see a patch of the Earth about that large in diameter. That's what they call its footprint. Um, that's what the satellite itself can see from horizon to horizon. So uh, a signal like 440 would um, head off into, the, into space here and, and be lost. So, so you can really only work that satellite if you happen to be in the footprint. So the satellite itself on board has got antennas. Um, they are not necessarily designed to be gain antennas. They are designed primarily to be omnidirectional because of the way that the satellite itself is spin stabilized in one axis pointing in one direction and then it flies around the earth so close to the earth that it really can't always be pointing towards the earth. So, um, so having gain on the satellite doesn't really help it very much. So, um, so instead they're really they're sort of omnidirectional antennas. And of course you try your best to make a perfect spherical omnidirectional performance, but there will always be some weakness compared to possibly some gain side. That's, um, that can happen. And so, for example, when this satellite is in orbit and the gain is pointing at the Earth, everything is pretty good, but then the satellite will continue around its orbit, and over here, it's no longer got that gain section pointing at Earth. Uh, instead, what you're, what you're getting towards Earth is, that, uh, is the slight decrease in performance from the antennas. So you see, the satellite itself, throughout its orbit, will, will change in signal strength. Um, you really can't do much about it, and you can expect to see that happen. And at the same time, it, of course, is rotating like this in some rotation. So you may be able to get, see some fade from it as it's doing that as well. So the effect of other users. This can be important. There are three operational modes on satellites. Um, FM, which I'm sure you've heard of, FM satellite, which is very similar to a uh, terrestrial FM repeater, and a transponder satellite, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and, a di and of course, digital modes. So FM, it, it's, uh, what, what's going on in FM satellites is very much the same as what's going on at a repeater. What the uh, repeater has is it has an FM detector. It will receive on a specific frequency an FM signal. It will amplify that signal and it will retransmit it out on a different frequency. That's what a terrestrial repeater will do. Well, that's pretty much exactly the same thing that an FM satellite is going to do. Um, it's going to receive FM signals only and it really is looking at one particular frequency. So one particular input frequency and uh, FM. Now a transponder on the other hand is slightly different. What it does is it listens, it, it receives a swath of frequencies. It's just uh, listening to a swath of frequencies. It's not using a simple FM detector. It's listening to a bandwidth of frequencies amplifies that uh, set of frequencies. It, it amplifies what it receives and then retransmits it on a different frequency. That's what a transponder is doing. The width of that swath is wide enough to support multiple conversations. Um, if you were going to do Morse code, for example, uh, you could fit a great deal of Morse code signals. So, so many groups of people could be having a communication back and forth in Morse code or in sideband um, on a transponder satellite at the same time. That's a little different than the FM repeater, which could really only have one person talking with one other person at the same time, since they're sort of on one frequency only. Digital is uh, similar to FM, although there may be more than one channel. 
and there's a variety of digital modes used. Um, so you could uplink digital data to the satellite and it could be immediately downlinked by someone else or it could store and forward it. It could, it could hold it for a while, just like sending an email to a mail server. And then someone somewhere else could download that email uh, and receive it. So uh, the, the satellites, you could, you could upload here and a half an hour later, it'll be over Europe and someone could download and then they could upload theirs and a half an hour later, you can have it. That's um, the digital modes can do that. So other users using the satellite at the same time. On an FM satellite, it's very similar to a uh, FM repeater. The loudest signal will be the one that wins. If four or five people try to communicate into the satellite at the same time, the strongest signal will be the one that will be, quote, captured by the uh, FM detector. And um, now you may have heard this on terrestrial repeaters where more than one person is trying to communicate on the repeater at the same time. Well, imagine that that repeater had a coverage that was a workable coverage that covered all of the Western states at the same time. So you see, a lot of people will be trying to communicate to the satellite at the same moment, and they tend to be very busy, and uh, the conversation then is really very short. Uh, all you really do is you put out your call sign, and your grid square and someone else replies with their call sign and grid square and that's the contact and, and that's it. Uh, you're off the satellite and, and, and wait for, and, and let other people get a chance to use it. Um, digital, sort of like that as well. You uplink something quickly and uh, you open, leave the channel open for other people to uplink. Transponders on the other hand, you can actually uh, stay on the air because there's other places on the transponder for people to communicate. So more, more than one conversation can be happening at once on the transponder. So it's an opportunity to uh, rag chew a little bit, uh, talk with friends and uh, work the whole thing. You're, you stay on the air and work the whole length of the pass on a transponder satellite. Um, However, you do have to keep in mind something. The, um, remember that the satellite is trying to faithfully reproduce the signal that it received in its receiver on, the, on its retransmission. So that would include the amplitude of the signal. So uh, if you're talking with someone on a transponder satellite and then an additional conversation takes place on the transponder with someone else in a different part of the uh, frequency of the transponder, then the overall power output uh, to you from the uh, satellite could be a little bit less because some of that power is being taken by the other signals. So the result of this is that you're going to get variable signal strength from the satellite. It's going to take place at random times. It could be due to the satellite's antenna. It could be due to the usage that's taking place by other people on the satellite at the same time. And that's just the way it is. Okay, now, what's the first thing that would be useful for satellites uh, work? Well, you need to know where they are. You need to know which one is overhead and so that you can start uh, determining what frequency to be on to try to listen to them. So the first step is probably to try to go ahead and get a hold of some software that will predict satellite location and frequency. So let's go take a look at one satellite program. This is, we're gonna look at SAT PC32. It's, uh, I'll, I'll step away from the, um, PowerPoint here again and open that program and we'll take a look. Okay, this is SatPC32. And here we are in California. You can see my mouse. And at the moment, there's nothing in the sky above us. But all of these circles that you see here are the footprints of various satellites. Let's look at it a little differently. Let's look at the 3D view over the Earth here. So 
this is where we stand right now. Here we are. And some of them are over the poles and they're coming our direction. So let's uh, do a quick little preview. I'm going to be, I'm going to predict for, forward in time here. Every step that I'm predicting forward is what? Uh, every two minutes. So we're going to watch a movie here that updates every two minutes. Here we go. Okay, there they are flying around. There's more to play. Look at that one. There's uh, plenty to play with. One more, one more, one more. They come by over us many, many times. Uh, about every 15 minutes or so, you get a little bit of uh, empty time, but then there's always some something happening. You're like, <laughs> you know, there's a number of things going to take place right there. Whole bunch of satellites at once. That's that's the way they are. Um, you, you you don't know what's going to be in the sky. You need to go take a look. Uh, so let's go back to our 2D map, and. Um, for example, we are looking. This is the uh, this is the coverage of. This, we're, we're currently looking at RS44, and that's what the blue ball is here. Let's see who comes next. Let's go back to our preview mode and see which one gets on top of us first here. Oh, okay. So oh, look at that. <laughs> I just happened to hit this one here. And you know what that is? That's the International Space Station. It's going to go overhead um, just about a half an hour from now. Um, I'll tell you what, let's don't look at that one. Let's look at uh, SO50. So let me get out of this mode here and turn on SO50. Find it here. Okay. So this is the this is the SO50 footprint, and this is its frequencies. Uh, the the downlink is on 440, so it's at 436, and you see that it's shifting. This is the predicting right now where the the absolute shifting of frequency as this thing coming and going, and this is the two meter frequency, the uplink, and that's the downlink frequency. Currently, it's way far away from us. You can see the range down here. It's 12,000 kilometers away. So let's uh, see what happens when it gets closer. Let's start our, our prediction. Okay, it's coming from the south, heading towards us. It's over the Pacific right now. And right about here, we're within its coverage, right at this time. We're within its coverage. It's about uh, 40 minutes from now. And you'll notice the footprint here allows us to be able to contact Hawaii on this satellite. In a, few, in a minute or two, <laughs> that was just two more minutes, now we could communicate with anybody in all of California on that satellite, plus a little bit of Nevada. And here we are in just, a, at this point here, just at the end of Hawaii, but uh, the coverage of this particular pass is California, all of Oregon, all of Washington, all the way over into Montana, and, and we could communicate up in that point. Now, keep in mind something. This satellite is a CubeSat. It's probably 5 watt output, and its range <laughs> at this point is 1,900 kilometers away. Surprisingly, that is still going to be quite useful, and you'll find that you can communicate with it quite well. Now, imagine that. This thing has got the same amount of power as a man standing with an HT, and uh, he's probably got a, an antenna that really is omnidirectional as well. <laughs> but the nature of space being so open and uh, without atmosphere and things is that you can, you can communicate with this satellite from that distance. I mean, you would probably be amazed and surprised if you were holding an HT uh, in San Jose and you managed to communicate with someone in downtown San Francisco who was using his HT. <laughs> but it, that's a, that would be an incredible uh, uh, leap. 
but it, but you'll be able to work a satellite 1,900 kilometers away with almost the same kind of power. That's that's what I find fascinating about satellite work. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Now, so we want to set up a station and we want to start working here. So, so what should we do first? Well, almost all of us have got an FM radio for two meter and four forty. You're you're going to need you're going to need two meters and four forty. And uh, if you want to work FM, then you can use an FM radio that's two meter and four forty. And you could use the same radio for digital modes. So I would suggest the very first thing that you do is go to the AMSAT page, find the satellites, um, find what frequency they are on, and program your radio for those frequencies. Then um, get a satellite prediction program so that you can know when they're going to be in the sky and monitor those frequencies. And you'll be surprised what you're going to hear. Uh, just with an HT and a relatively small antenna, it's very likely that you're going to hear quite well. A good set of headphones, of course, will help uh, because these are going to be a little bit noisy conversations. Uh, get yourself some software. I should say next step, I should say, how about we do that first? <laughs> now, gain antennas, well, uh, gain, it's always gain is better, of course. But of course, with a gain antenna requires that you find a way to point them correctly. There's just, there's no way around that. You have to be able to be pointing the antenna, a gain antenna in the right direction. So if you're going to go for gain antennas, you're also going to need to create some methodology for pointing. Now, for the transponders, you would probably like to use single sideband, uh, Morse code, or something like that. And that's where you need an all-mode radio. And um, 2 meter and 440 all-mode radios are not nearly as common in this world as FM radios. Almost all of us have got some form of FM 2 meter and 440. Uh, but an all-mode radio for the same frequencies is not so common. But that would be definitely worth having. Okay. Let's say that you just want to use a handheld and you want to make contacts well. Now, these people here are making very good contacts. Um, you can see that what they're doing is they're making a plan to point in the right direction. They've got a, an estimate uh, of where they believe the satellite was going to be, and they're pointing some gain antenna in those directions. Now, it's not a lot of gain. For example, on two meters here, it's really a three element uh, antenna here for two meters, which is not much gain. Quite honestly, that really is, uh, it's got a, a pattern that's 45 degrees wide or so. So it's mostly just everything in this direction is uh, on two meters. So he's really, as far as pointing accurately, it's just that it's important that he's pointing to the left side of himself than to the right side of himself. Uh, the particular antennas he's holding there are not so um, pointy that he has to be extremely accurate. Now, of course, there's always gain antennas. Um, the multiple elements and things like this on 440 and two meters. And in this kind of a gain, you probably want some kind of a rotator. Uh, for azimuth and elevation. Um, even in this case, though, I'm going to say that you don't have to be that accurate. Um, if you've got enough gain to be able to hear well, then you could still be off pointing from the satellite 10 or 15 degrees and you'll still hear it well. Uh, you won't, of course, you will not hear it if it's below the horizon. Uh, but up at the sky, uh, the sky is open. And so you can do well. Uh, you don't have to be that accurate with your pointing. In fact, you may only just have to rotate your antennas around and not necessarily change them much in elevation. And you'd probably be okay. The real issue is, can you receive? Can you hear? Can you understand the conversation? And that's where good headphones come into play in a nice, quiet environment. And if you uh, 
are attempting towards the satellites with gain and you find that it's fading and coming and going, don't start believing that that's a problem with your equipment. Um, just wait because the fade may return. Uh, the satellite uh, may come right back. It may not be you. It may be that the reason it faded away is because of the satellite itself, because of other users on the satellite, because of all those things we discussed. Okay, so a radio. Uh, what, what's, the, what's the right thing to get started with? You'll notice that the... Uh, uh, that the, the two meters and 440, it's really, it's 435. It's in the range of 435. It's not in the actual um, repeater band section of 440 to 450. It's lower than that. So a lot of the time, the, uh, the satellites are 440 as a down length. So what you're doing is you're receiving at 435 and you're transmitting at two meters. So uh, check your radio and see if that you can actually receive down in these lower frequencies. Um, 1.2 gigahertz band is used on the satellites in a number of places for telemetry, which is fun to do, uh, but you really don't need to have a 1.2 gig capability to be able to work the satellites. Um, this is really what you need, 2 meters and 440, or, and let's look at it carefully, 2 meters and 435. Okay, so FM, of course, is the most common radio, and there were plenty of satellites that we could look at for both, uh, both voice and digital using FM radios, and there's a lot of fun to be had at that location. Therefore, there's a lot of people out there doing it, <laughs> so, and you can expect the satellites to be quite busy on that uh, at FM. Uh, for all mode, using... Uh, Morse code and sideband and things like this. Well, maybe the first thing to do is to just work on all mode receive. Now, you'll be surprised at all mode receive. There's a lot of ways to do that other, other than radio. Um, and of course, all mode for transmit and receive. Well, there's also some other tricks. Um, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but um, you can get a uh, wideband, basically turn this into a complete all-mode receiver, a USB dongle uh, that can receive everything you need to receive from satellites. Uh, the whole 2-meter band, the whole 440 band, and these things can be in the range of $15 up to $50. And uh, what you're doing here is you're using software. This is SDR, Software Defined uh, Receive, Software Defined Radio. And of course, you can receive all modes with such a thing. Now, that will give you a chance to get an idea what, uh, what's going on on the transponder satellites. If you want to communicate, if you want to transmit on the transponder satellites, you need to have a, an all mode radio. You should work with an all, all mode radio. Um, so there is a lot going on out there. Satellite operation is actually very busy. Um, I think it's got a chance. <laughs> it gives us all a look at the future and uh, that whole thing of space, the final frontier, and all of those things gives you a chance to play with, uh, with what's really going on out there. I uh, would say that it's, it's very active. Internationally, it's very active. There's a lot of university involvement with a lot of far-reaching ideas. Uh, putting together a station doesn't have to be that hard. You can start with your handheld and a good set of headphones and find out where the satellite is, what frequency to on. It's not necessarily going to be simple, but it's not impossible. And uh, listen and see what you hear you might be surprised. Or then, of course, you can go for it and you can start working, working yourself into some gain antennas. With, and then, of course, you will have to have the ability to point those antennas. You don't have to be extremely accurate, but you will have to point. And aim for the stars. I hope to hear you on the air. Thank you very much.